plagiarism is very much a current focus of interest and concern. Um, and we're going to look today at how plagiarism has infested the world of science, and particularly the world of the microscope, because we have to start with somewhere and give it some sort of theme. But I'd like to begin in a much more general way, if I can, because we need in some way to, to define the terms. Plagiarism, for the person who is plagiarised, is a dreadful scourge. But to the academic short of material, or the student with a pressing deadline, it is often used as a solace and regarded as such. And yet the modern era of the internet, as the librarian has reminded us, has brought knowledge extraordinarily close to us. Google is no more than a lubricant. That's all Google is. It was always possible to search through the world's catalogues, to read the world's scientific literature, and to run to earth whatever fact it was that you wished to obtain. It's just that it might have taken you several centuries to find the very one that you wanted. The point about Google is that it is merely a search engine. And it's extraordinary to think that just by typing in the words of the subject that you wish to research, you immediately have access to the literature. None of this literature is on Google. Google simply diverts you to where the information is. It is a, a signposting system that speeds up access. And yet, of course, the, the accessibility of information means that students, time and time again, find they have means of short-circuiting the ordinary uh, didactic process. I mean, here, for example, are the first hits on Google if you look up a search for free essays or, or homework done for you. Uh, brilliant research papers, custom written essays for you. Are you ready? Um, are you ready to written cover letter homework to experience? <laughs> Not very experienced, it would seem. We have over 100,000 essays and papers ready to download now. Custom essay writing service. Buy essays written. Buy thesis paper. Not entirely certain that these people really know what they're talking about. <laughs> Many of them, of course, sound as though English is not the first language. And one knows that in Asia there are factories turning these things out. Our free essays, book reports and paper writing database. And at the bottom, an essay or paper on ready-made. Well, there we go. Uh, but students tend to go online. They used to go online, find encyclopedia, uh, encyclopedia articles... Um, cut and paste them and just drop them into their own homework. Now you can actually get access to free, pre-written dissertations and essays. And it is becoming very difficult now to be sure that a student who's turning in brilliant work has actually done the work themselves. And indeed, plagiarism is very often ignored. It's now so widespread that more and more people accept it as a kind of an occupational hazard of being in uh, academia. But the extent of it is extraordinary. I mean, here is a paper this year in Nature which points out, and this is an extraordinary statistic, that at uh, Zhejiang University, their science journal, that almost a third of the papers submitted had been plagiarised. Not just one in 50, 30.9% of the papers that had been submitted had been um, plagiarised. The, the, the emphasis on competition and on success and on publication at all costs in Asia is much more pronounced than it now is uh, in the West. And as a result, uh, their science minister has come out to say, and this again is a report from uh, uh, this month, that, that plagiarism in Chinese publications will not be tolerated. Yet there are so many examples of where people have become quite eminent because of work that turns out later to have been plagiarised. And yet you do need to uh, understand the way in which morals and ethics change. To me, plagiarism is theft. And indeed, the Harvard Business Review in, uh, I think, 2007 published an article saying that, that you should plagiarise for all your worth. And they just published a blog in which a chap says, was it Picasso or T.S. Eliot who said, good artists borrow, great artists steal? Who cares? 
I mean, it is now common for people to feel that it's okay to steal ideas. I would say one thing to Michael Schwage about his, his blog. He said, was it Picasso or T.S. Eliot who said it? Well, this man is writing online. If he wants to know who said it, just do a search for the quote. And if you search for the quote with Picasso, you get about a dozen hits. If you search with T.S. Eliot, you only get one hit, and that's this article. So, in fact, I'm not certain why he's posing this rhetorical question, since, as an internet user, he could have answered it quicker than it took him to write the fact that he didn't know what the answer was. And, of course, plagiarism has invaded the highest and most influential areas of uh, debate. Um, the war in Iraq was declared uh, because of this uh, dossier of facts showing that Saddam Hussein and his cohorts had uh, weapons of mass destruction ready for deployment, and yet it turned out that the core of this document had been plagiarised from a ten-year-old postgraduate essay that happened to have appeared online. and was believed to be so obscure that nobody ever thought it would be found. Um, as a result, this example of plagiarism was internationally condemned as being scandalous. Now, I mean, this is, you know, this is like a bank robbery. You can't steal someone's ideas. And yet, of course, you do have to accept that the notion of what plagiarism is depends on who is using the term. To, to my mind, there's no argument. Plagiarism is theft. With plagiarism, you take someone else's creative endeavour and present it as your own. In that sense, the students who are going online and using ready-made essays aren't plagiarising anybody. If they've stolen the essay, it's plagiarism. If they bought it, or it's been given to them free for their use, then they have been dishonest. But that's not plagiarism. We will also come later in my talk to the notion of self-plagiarism. And that term is widely misunderstood. People say that self-plagiarism is when an academic takes work he published a long time ago and republishes it uh, as though it had never been previously published. Now that, by definition, isn't plagiarism. There's no theft involved. It is Whoever is writing, it is their intellectual property. Nobody has misappropriated it. They're being dishonest because they're suggesting it's new and it's old. But although that's widely spoken of as self-plagiarism, that is not an example of plagiarism at all. Plagiarism has to involve some sort of dishonesty. And I rather like this little cartoon excerpt from The Symptoms, uh, I will not plagiarise Iraq reports, because it reminds you of this conflict. How can you expect children, students, to become honest and straightforward and have the integrity that one hopes to find in academia when they know that their highest rulers are indulging in these dishonest practices? It's very difficult to condemn a child for doing something that they've watched a legitimate government do. Well, how do you detect plagiarism? There are plenty of software facilities now. This is one called Turnitin, where if you if you uh, subscribe to this service, it will search through the internet and find a document with similar bits in and give you an indication of how much of this has been plagiarised from other sources. There's a score, in this case, of uh, an overall similarity index of 94% between this and a previously existing disparate publication that was available um, uh, online. It's not actually as hard as that. You don't really need to subscribe to anything or even wait while it does its calculations. If you doubt whether the work of a student is original or not, the easiest way to do it is simply to take a, a rather unusual grammatical construction, search for it in double quotes so that you search for the entire phrase, and if it exists somewhere else, it will pop up. It's quite easy. I mean, although online gives access to documents from which students can plagiarise their work, it also gives us as much easy access to the original document from which they did the plagiarism. So it is very much a, a two-edged sword. I am never forget the day. I first meet the great Lobachevsky. In one word, he told me the secret of success. Plagiarise. Plagiarise. Let no one else's work evagerise. Remember why the good Lord made your eyes, so don't shade your eyes, but plagiarize, plagiarize, plagiarize. Be sure always to call it, please, research. The wonderful man, Tom Lehrer. People often say to me,
Tom Lehrer was such a great satirist. He's still with us. He hasn't died. Um, but, uh, of course, his, uh, his records, I'm sure all of you know them. Um, what you may not realise, I've got some of the originals that were published in, I think, 1967 and 68. And he had them privately pressed because no one was interested. They thought the satire was too biting and it wouldn't be popular. And it's quite interesting to realise that he, as it were, was a, a self-publisher when he began to put these wonderful examples uh, online. But Lehrer's comments on plagiarism are, of course, extremely uh, timely. And it's not new. It isn't new. Let us take this uh, Giorgione painting from 1510, and if you would like to look at a painting that comes a few decades later, and you will see that this is an example of artistic plagiarism by no less a person than Titian himself. Now, in the sense that the picture isn't exactly copied, it isn't as though someone has done a line-for-line a line reproduction and claimed it as their own. But we have here a different problem that you get a lot in the graphic arts. And that is the use of a picture as a reference. And what will happen is that if a publisher is doing a major artwork, a book of some sort, they may ask an artist, or they may ask a photographer, uh, if they please would care to submit some superb images that might want to go into this book. When the image arrives, the publisher will say to their artist, can you please do a picture of this using this as your reference? That's to say, this is what you copy, but make it a subtly different. And the artist will then copy this beautiful image of a, a tiger from a rare photograph snapped by a brave and underfunded explorer and send the picture back and say, no, we're not going to use your picture, but in the book, there it is. And it is accepted that that picture has been used as an image, as a reference by the later artist. And I don't think any of us who aren't artists, don't think any of us realise how difficult it is to actually to conceive a construction and put it down in, uh, uh, in graphic form. Now here's an example, a, a tiny mystery which I solved from Oxborough Hall, where they have uh, Queen Mary's um, great uh, tapestries, the, the Marianne hangings, and one of them shows this strange creature, a bird of America, it says, and notice, here are her initials, Maria Regina. Um, she spent a lot of time doing these um, slightly gaudy, and it has to be said with great respect to her memory, not terribly expert embroideries and, and tapestries. <coughs> but I realised where this came from. <coughs> because here is the original bird from uh, Gesner's Historia Animalium. Um, and the relationship between the two is quite clear. This is an example, ladies and gentlemen, of where somebody designing a work of art has used an existing work of art as a reference. It's not plagiarism. This is the use as a reference. And I found it quite satisfying, since the origin of this picture had caused uh, quite a lot of um, puzzlement to be able to explain where, in fact, it had uh, come from. But let's look at a more ex modern example. Here is a Disney still uh, from their uh, appalling version of uh, Winnie the Pooh. And, and here we see a scene from the Jungle Book. And if we put the two pictures together, you can see very plainly how the artist has used the existing picture as a reference. This could not be condemned as plagiarism. Even the knots in the wood are the same. But when somebody has gone to all the trouble of creating this graphic image, it's much easier just to take it and put it on your side of your easel and recreate it rather than to start de novo and uh, make some new artistic um, image. And some people, as this cartoonist suggests, some people do regard plagiarism rightly as a crime. Plagiarism is theft, and there is an awful lot of it about. Here's an example. Um, I quite like this. This is from a recently published blog, and the blogger says... Topsell's book, Four-Footed Beasts, appeared in 1607. Here's his picture of a hyena and how strangely distorted it is because this is what a hyena looks like. But, of course, the blogger is wrong. 
it isn't a hyena, it's very obviously a baboon. It is just, in the process of compilation, given the wrong name. And not only that, it isn't topsails anyway. Because Gesner, if we go back to his 1561 publication, he is the person who originally published this, this baboon, mislabeled as a hyena. Um, and by the time that uh, Edward Topsell came along, he had pinched and copied almost line for line the same image. So you mustn't imagine plagiarism is new. After Topsell, uh, we had the Reverend Mr. Johnson, the Reverend Mr. Johnson, um, in 1760, and again it is the same image. Don't be surprised, of course, that it's a mirror image, since inevitably if the engraver copies line for line a picture on a sheet of copper and then inks it and turns it, it becomes a mirror image in the act of printing. And so very often, and we'll see other examples, these plagiarised images are perfect mirror images of what went before. It is Dürer's very famous drawing of the rhinoceros, and people often say how wonderful it must have been for him to be the first person to study this animal and portray it. But in fact, he never did see a rhinoceros. It was being presented to the Pope and drowned in the catastrophic shipwreck uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, and drawings of it were put together by Portuguese seamen on board. And from those drawings, Albrecht Dürer recreated the picture. And it's a wonderful, I mean, it's a very powerful and realistic image of a rhinoceros. Nobody has any problem with it. But I want to draw your attention to a tiny little facet of this picture. That is that on the back there is a tiny little point. Do you see that? It's extremely small. Like a miniature ice cream cone that a child has left on the back of a rhino in the zoo. I mean, in fact, smaller than that. It's a weeny little spike. It's a piece of artistic license. By the time this drawing had been engraved for wider publication, this uh, extraneous horn had increased somewhat in size. Gesner's original drawing was actually engraved for a mass distribution uh, well over a century, a century and a quarter after he originally published it. And once again, you can see that little horn is just perceptibly larger than it was. As time went by, the horn began to get even bigger. And indeed, by the time we get to 1708, François Legault is publishing a picture in which that imaginary horn is virtually the same size as the one on its nose. Uh, so, I mean, from that point of view, you can see quite clearly, it, it's very interesting to take images with an error and to trace the lineage of the image as it moves through the centuries of scientific publication. A great example is the, the Great Orc. Um, the last great hawk was killed in the 1770s, if I remember rightly, by a Scottish fisherman, believing it to be a witch. And one was possessed by that great Dane, Ole Vorm. Uh, he had it as a pet, and he used to take it for walks on the end of a little leash. And around its neck it had a little pink ribbon collar. And as a result, when he published a drawing of his great hawk, it had this collar in place. And for following centuries... The great orc was portrayed as though it had a white collar, and which in fact it never did. But the fact that people copy from images rather than portraying the life bedevils everybody who decides to compile an encyclopedia. Um, there are in fact entire, I, I speak now with a microbiological hat on, there are entire families of microorganisms that, that exist only in the pages of encyclopedias, having been inaccurately copied over the years. Nobody ever draws the object. They always draw a previous, previous published version of the object. And in that way, as in the case of this non-existent horn of the rhinoceros, the problem becomes exacerbated and the lineage can be traced. And here from a couple of years ago, the last time I actually saw the same rhino portrayed was on a left note in uh, Bulgaria. So it, it still lives on. Well, let's go back to the roots of science. And to the very first science book ever published, Robert Hooke's Micrographia, which came out at the end of 1664. It's imprimatur in 1665. A wonderful book in which he decided to document the microscopic world. And in its pages he had uh, engravings he carefully supervised 
uh, this famous picture showing what his microscope uh, was like. And uh, he also published seminal drawings. Uh, some of them have such a vivid three-dimensional clarity. They look like scanning electron micrographs. This is a human head louse. Uh, the entire picture opens up to about uh, two-thirds of a metre uh, in length. And it is a wonderfully vivid and accurate portrayal. If we just take the picture and look at it on its own, it's quite breathtaking, the, the detail that can be seen. And his extraordinary technical and artistic skill is, uh, is breathtaking even now. Uh, as well as the head louse, he also portrayed the flea. Uh, all of these things, of course, are very familiar to Hook, and uh, not through hearsay either. Um, the same flea was copied by many other workers. And you can tell it's the same flea because the disposition of the limbs is exactly the same in each case. So here is uh, uh, Bonani. Here, for example, is, is the head louse uh, from Hook, uh, from Bonani, and from uh, Adams in 1771. Clearly, and again, you see the mirror image flipping as you go from one generation of copyist to the next. Um, here is Bonani's picture. And yet, as soon as that first appeared, I'll wager that you thought for a split second, ah, yes, that's Robert Hooke's drawing of the last week. We just saw it. Uh, the copying is faithful. And it's curious to note that in many of these books, the preface begins by saying, these are all my own drawings, my own original work. These are studies from life and have not been copied from any other source. There's a touch of the Lady Macbeth about all of this, ladies and gentlemen. The more that anybody says, this work is definitely my own, the more you can take it for granted that it isn't. After all, if you were to go to a sweet shop and a chewing little boy were to say, I haven't been pinching any sweet, it, it is not likely that he's speaking the truth. And by exactly the same logic, if, if an author says to you, this is my own work, it hasn't been stolen from anybody else, then look closely at the pictures and they may ring nostalgic bells when you think back to what you saw. This book by George Adams, who was famous for making microscopes, uh, uh, this famous book, Micrographia Illustrata, was actually a sales catalogue. It began with microscopic observations, but the latter pages said, buy my microscopes and you can do this too. And he has been very widely praised for his pictures, yet I don't think you'll have any doubt in recognising a simplified version of Robert Hooke's head louse and Robert Hooke's flea. And if we look through the pages of this book, it becomes quite easy to reconcile Adams's drawing on the right with Hooke's originals. This, for example, is the foot of a fly uh, with the um, surface hairs, the pads and these little hooks. And here is the eye of a fly showing its, uh, uh, the, the head of the fly showing its palps and its compound eye structure. And if we go back to look at Robert Hooke, you will see there is Hooke's drawing of the foot of the fly. Nobody, I think, is going to suggest that that is a pure coincidence. And here is Hooke's drawing of the head of a house fly. Now, notice something. In fact, the, the gradation of size of these ocelli is continuous. And yet, the way that the engraver has drawn it, they actually form in bands, with small ones here and larger ones there. That's not exactly what a fly is like. But, of course, you can see that the same convention has been copied uh, in Adams's uh, use of that image. Let's have another look. Here Adams has drawn a mosquito and a gnat larva and a fly and has been widely um, celebrated for the accuracy and the detail of his drawings. If you would like to take the same pictures back from Robert Hooke's Micrographia, uh, I think you'd agree that the lineage of inspiration is entirely unambiguous. Uh, there is Robert Hooke's original drawing of the gnat larva, and as you can see, again, it is uh, rotated, <coughs> as is inevitable. But you can see quite clearly the, shall I politely call it, line of influence. And the same is true of the gnat at the top. The Adams drawings are much cruder. Uh, there is less subtlety of tone, less gradation. Uh, but nonetheless, the the lineage is clear. Um, Robert Hooke also drew these snowflakes, six rayed snowflakes. I noticed in the shops 
now that Christmas decorations are here, that a number of the shops show snowflakes to have eight rays. It's quite remarkable how long you can go through scientific orthodoxy and still not educate people into the realities of the world. And, and people have often sympathised with Poor Book because his work was flagrantly stolen. Uh, he had enormous battles um, with uh, eminent Cambridge academics, none of whom I need to name here. And he was a, a, a vituperative and unfriendly character, a man of whom there is no portrait. But if I saw him in the street, I would at once recognise him because he's described so vividly as having long, thin, tapering fingers and straggly hair and grey eyes and a hunched back and slender, long, tapering fingers who would walk nervously against the wall rather than out towards the pavement or the roadway. So if I saw him from a hundred metres distance, I'd know Robert Hooke, although he's never been portrayed. He has endlessly been empathised with and sympathised with because of the way in which his work is plagiarised. Now, I would say to anybody who, and, and every month people come on to me and say, my work has just been plagiarised, and I always say the same thing. I say, then it means you've arrived. Anybody who publishes anything decent will find it plagiarised by somebody else. If your work hasn't been plagiarised, then bad news to you, it obviously wasn't similar enough. It is almost uh, a badge of honour. It is almost a sign of recognition. And I hate to tell you this, but Robert Hooke, who was so widely plagiarised after the book came out, was himself a dyed-in-the-wool plagiarist. These snowflakes don't look much like real snowflakes. They're cartoony versions. And if you wonder where they came from, well, this is where they came from. Here are Thomas Bartholin's snowflakes, published four years earlier. And the book had just become available at the Royal Society when Robert Hooke was doing his work. By the way, Bartholin was an extremely clever chap. He's speculating on why it is that snowflakes have six points. And so he almost draws a molecular model. This is 1661, in which he shows how spheres that pack together will inevitably give rise to six points of contact. He says that may be, it's almost as though he's trying, through his primitive concept of what the molecular structure of water might be, to work out why there are six rays to a snowflake. In, in fact, it's a meaningless, it's a, not the right explanation, but for its time it's terribly clever. But if we put his pictures together, uh, there is uh, Hooks on the left and Bartholin on the right, there is no question whatever about the way in which Robert Hooke, <coughs> quite shamelessly, used, again, as a reference, he used Bartholin's um, pictures. And when, yet when you read Robert Hooke's account, and he says, I would have drawn more, but I got so terribly cold out in the winter with my microscope in the open air, shivering, and even my thickest cloak couldn't prevent the... You, you, you read these words and you think, oh, you poor bugger, you were so devoted to the microscopy of snow that you just... No, he didn't. He sat there by a roaring log fire, turned the pages of Bartholin's book, and shamelessly pinched all of the images that Bartholin had himself published. So what's it like being plagiarised? Well, um, in 1981, uh, I had the great good fortune to discover Leeuwenhoek specimens. And those are the references in the first three weeks after it was published. It, it was all over the web, and indeed it still is to my great embarrassment. One of the things I did was to, to photograph through Leeuwenhoek's own microscope, circa 1690, the picture of Leeuwenhoek's own specimen. This is a section of the pith from an elder. I mean, what a beautiful shot that is. It was such a revelation. I was the first person for 308 years to look at one of Leeuwenhoek's specimens through one of Leeuwenhoek's microscopes. I mean, can you imagine the excitement of doing that? And very shortly afterwards, I heard <coughs> that the Burhal Museum were going to do a travelling exhibition on Leeuwenhoek. And indeed they were going to include the work on the specimens. Though I, I discovered, to my surprise, they were going to reprise the work, I'm sure that's the polite way of putting it, um, without actually making any reference to my own publications on these specimens. Uh, and in fact their bibliography uh, didn't include any of the Ford publications at all uh, when it came out. They referred instead to uh, Bracegirdle's book, and if, if you read Bracegirdle's book, it actually says there are no microscopical specimens from the 1600s. 
Um, so, so the reference that was given was in fact to a publication that denied that the specimens could even exist. Now when the page came out, there was one of the specimen packets that I had the great uh, good fortune to find, a cotton seed cut into 24 round slices. And here is their picture, which I think Grace Gurdon took, uh, of Elder, taken exactly as I had done it through Leibniz's microscope. And if you look at their uh, picture, you can see that the amount of detail is really not very good. It's technically not a very satisfying picture. And um, if you put the two together, you can see these are the same specimen photographed through exactly the same lens. And you can see how it is possible to get a fabulously detailed picture, whereas the one they published in this museum catalogue was actually a lot uh, less distinct. Now, I long since um, gave up being irritated when people plagiarise your work. It happens all the time. Um, more often than not, if somebody has reproduced something and you mention it to them, when a new edition comes out, they apologise and give you um, full reference to your original uh, uh, citation. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it's often done through um, carelessness rather than through uh, mendacity. But when people do do it, I get really irritated when they do the stuff again and don't get such good results because there is a propaganda in the field of science that early microscopes were rubbish. You couldn't see much through them, that they gave you very poor and inferior images. And these views keep on perpetrating the same kind of calumny, which I think is so, um, uh, so unfortunate. And I do like very much the notion, as this cartoonist said, that somebody doing a report on plagiarism might be censored for having plagiarised it all. So what about broadcasting? This is a proposal I put to the BBC in 2007. Uh, I thought that it would be a good idea to do a programme a, a short series of documentaries about the living cell. And so I sent this, poo, uh, I sent this proposal to um, the Director General of the BBC, um, who is an old friend, and whom I met when he was at uh, Channel 4. And we kept in contact. Uh, we kept in contact, that was it. Now the broadcast media survive on plagiarism. If you go into a television newsroom, when they're putting the news bulletin together, and the desks are covered with the daily papers. And people are cutting out stories and saying, ring this chap up and do an interview with him. This is a really good story. The, the broadcast media have always run like a benevolent parasite. I'm not sure whether benevolent is the right word. On the back of the print newspapers. They hunt through newspapers and magazines to get their leads onto stories. Um, it, it's always been the way. And uh, I sent this to a chap called Martin Davidson, who was their commissioning uh, producer, and um, no, I heard nothing. And eventually when I followed it up, he came back and I managed to get an answer from him several months later, in which he said, well, it was a nice idea. But firstly, it would never be a series. And secondly, it would never be produced by the BBC. So if I wanted to look at an independent company, and put it forward as a fait accompli, that would be fine. But the BBC as producers weren't interested. So I was a little shocked, though not at all surprised, to be told a little while later that the BBC were actually producing a series of programmes called The Cell. And it was going to be a series, although they told me they weren't going to do one, and it was being produced by the BBC, although they said they couldn't possibly do it themselves. Now, they then took some of the work that I had done with Robert Brown's microscope. And he produced fabulous images <coughs> of the cell and the cell nucleus. And indeed, they sent uh, a message to the Linnaean Society of London in Piccadilly, um, of which I had the honour to be their um, honorary surveyor of scientific instruments. I was abroad at the time. And they said, uh, no, we, we want to redo the experiments ourselves. We won't make any mention of the originals. So they did. And when the programme went out, this is the sequence in which they showed how Robert Brown had examined cells. And this, I think the politest word would be a uh, pathetic um, attempt, um, was what they broadcast. And again, it creates the impression, you see, that these early microscopes couldn't really see much and that the discoveries they made were largely imagination. 
These blobs are the stomata, the breathing pores. Well, I'd originally done this experiment in the 1980s, and the picture that if we take a still photograph that the BBC transmitted, that is all that you could see through that microscope. Now, using the same specimen and the same lens, we had decades ago published this view, which is wonderfully, lyrically, crisply clear. I mean, it's so exciting to take the microscopes that these early pioneers used and look through them and, and to tease from these primitive, simple little pieces of brass and glass an image that shows you what they saw. And you realise that the modern inability to, to repeat it, uh, this is uh, our experimental version, that's the BBC's repeat, it, it, it is so gratifying to be able to say to modern scientists, look, I've repeated the experiments as he did them. And it isn't true that these pictures were of poor quality. It isn't true that the microscopes only gave you little fuzzy glimpses of cells. In actual fact, the picture is almost as good as you get through a modern microscope. And I will mention to you that these are the best pictures of the stomata of a leaf that I've ever taken. Taken with a microscope made about 1820. And if ever I'm talking about plant physiology and stomata come up, I use this slide. Nobody has ever said afterwards, that slide was a bit grotty, old boy. That must have been taken with an early primitive microscope. Because, in fact, a lot of the slides that current microscopists are showing at the same conference aren't as good as the picture that I was able to tease from this 1820 microscope. So, all the time that one is striving to show people uh, what it is that the original scientists achieved, you have other people picking up the idea and running with it trying to repeat it, but simply perpetrating the old myths. And this is the great danger of the broadcast media, when they take published work and then rehash it. It happens all the time. You will often hear on Radio 4 a programme about, um, oh, I don't know, will malaria invade Britain uh, with global warming? Let's take that as a topic. And let's assume that it's on at half past 11 in the morning on BBC Radio 4 as a documentary programme. And as it's trailed, you'll hear our reporter, John Jones, is putting this fascinating idea forward. And you think, gosh, that's terrific. Well, next time you hear one of those, listen carefully. Because about 10 minutes into the programme, you'll hear him say, this is John Jones, the presenter, who's getting all the credit. You'll hear him say, the whole subject of the reinvasion of malaria has been discussed by Professor Frank Windsor in his recent book, Will Malaria Return to Britain? Bingo, suddenly you think, that's where they got it from. It isn't John Jones's programme at all. They've taken Professor Windsor's book, made it into a programme, incorporated it by interviewing him, but giving no credit to him as the originator of the idea. Um, uh, my first book was on uh, German secret weapons in World War II. And two uh, Hollywood companies have made a series of documentaries about, about the book. And when you go to be interviewed by them, there is your book with all these little post-it notes. And they're all beaver beaverishly away, writing notes from it and, and working out what to say next. But, of course, if they actually did the proper thing and went to the publisher and said, we'd like to make a programme about Brian Ford or Professor Windsor's book, then the publisher would charge them a fee, and the author would get a large cut of it, 70% if he's lucky. But if they simply imagine, if they simply pretend that they're re-examining the subject and then involving the author, they can use the book for nothing, pretend it's their idea, and by interviewing the author, get all the first-hand information that you need. And the broadcast media do this all the time. There's just been this comment, hasn't there, from the Prime Minister? about his regrets over Panorama, looking at bribery and corruption in the football, the International Football Administration. And uh, it's going to be a great, big, dynamic programme, which is going to attract a lot of attention. But was it, it was one of the Sunday papers, the Sunday News of the World or the Daily Mail, they're the ones who actually spent probably tens of thousands of pounds actually setting up this story and breaking the news. What the Panorama programme are doing, getting the newspaper cuttings out, elaborating it and making it later into a programme. So again, this isn't plagiarism. They're not plagiarising someone. They're simply 
lifting their ideas as an inspiration. It's rather analogous, in my view, to the way in which artists use uh, an existing drawing as an inspiration for what they are then going to produce. So, if my view is that the republication of an academic's work is not plagiarism, because you can't steal from yourself, can you plagiarise yourself? And the answer is yes. And this is one of the most amusing little things that has ever happened to me in my long and embarrassingly varied um, career. Self-plagiarism is very frequently found in the literature of science to describe the way in which people republish their stuff. But I'm concerned with when your publisher pinches your own work and uses it in a later book without you even knowing. This book, Images of Science, came out in uh, 1992. And in it I looked at the development of scientific imagery. Uh, in all of the various sciences. Now, the idea of the book was very simple. I was going to write the book and give them a shopping list of images. And, of course, because the British Library has all the books, there were no copyright problems or reproduction problems. And they said that we'll get all the images from the resources of the British Library's extensive holdings. Now, we have our librarian here today, and I'm not even going to embarrass her <laughs> by looking for a response to whether this might happen in Cambridge. Because what actually happened was this. They, I sent them in the first list of a dozen pictures. And after they got the first one, they came and said, we can't do it. Retrieving the images from our resources will take too long for the publication schedule. So could I provide all the artwork? And when we had a meeting over lunch to discuss it, they said, the thing is that we've got your list of pictures fully referenced. So that means that an individual has to go to the shelf and find the book and retrieve it. Then they have to turn to the page and identify the picture. Then that has to be all written up on a special requisition form and then put in a place to be collected by the photographer. Then it has to be taken by the photographer, who in this case <coughs> was an external company, not somebody on the BL's staff. Take it over. They then have to open it up and position it and photograph it. And then, this is before digital, and then the negative, or bigger part of the transparency, then has to be fully annotated and sent back with the book, which goes back to the library department, who then have to transmit the whole thing across to the publications office in a different building, and say to them, this is the picture that goes on that page of Brian Ford's new book. And they said it's going to be so long the administration is so complex that it's going to take us, we reckon, five to seven years to get out these couple of hundred pictures. Um, it's just important. So can you please do them for us? So although they had all the pictures there, I had to provide almost all the pictures, except one. They said to me there was one of the pictures which they did provide from the Science Museum. But that shows us just how complicated it's going to be. Anyway, time went by, and I was sent the page proof with that picture on, and it was a picture of early Italian microscopes. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm glad we're having that one in the book, because I'd actually found this picture years earlier, in the early 1970s, when I began research on early microscopes. And um, it's never been published, if, if never been published anywhere apart from in my own publication. And if you look it up on Google Images, you'll find there are only four or five references to it anywhere, and they all point back to um, that original book. So I thought, well, I know how difficult it was to get, and clearly they found how difficult it was too. And uh, this is the picture. It's quite a fascinating picture. This is the first ever image of an ivory slider with little insect specimens mounted in um, that had never been seen before. Here's another way of having a whole range of specimens under one microscope. You simply rotate the disc and you can change from one specimen to another. It's an extremely good picture. And uh, I thought, you know, it, it does look terribly familiar because it had originally appeared in this book that came out in 1973. And then, because I am a microscopist, I did something that most people don't do. 
I looked at it rather closely. Now, do you remember those advertisements for hobnob biscuits? Where a consumer of these cookies has dropped the occasional crumb and the clue is given by sharply zooming into the crumb on the tablecloth as evidence that, that one of these biscuits has been consumed. That, ladies and gentlemen, is how I look at life. If I'm over here and there's a minute black speck on there, which you, well, which the women amongst you would immediately wipe away and which the men amongst you wouldn't even notice, I want to know what that black speck is. And I'll peer very closely and think to myself, ah, oh, that's interesting. That means the person who came here had been there and done such and such. I tend to look at the tiny things in life. So I looked very closely under the microscope at uh, the picture that they had just sent me, and that's what it looked like. Now, this is the picture from my original book, published in 1973, and you can see that there are slight dusty marks on it, which have been rendered by the half-tone screen. This is quite a coarse half-tone. It's uh, about uh, 120 dots to the inch. And this is the same part of the same picture as they submitted it for the new book, uh, where it's now 200 dots. The printing in the modern world is better than it was in the 1970s. But I noticed that the same dots and infelicities appeared, which seemed rather strange. So I looked at them more closely. This is the original 1973 book that Brian Ford had written. And this is the picture that the British Library have provided for Brian Ford's new book. And in fact, what the thieving little buggers had done, and I can find no politer words than that, was steal the picture from the earlier book, uh, uh, which had been published by Harrops, and the copyright of which belongs to me. They'd stolen the, book, uh, the picture from the book and submitted it to go in the new book. And this is the British Library. And again, you see these little tiny blemishes. That must have been a little hair of some sort, but it's been rendered in the half-tone as those black dots. And not the image of the hair, but the image of the black dots has been faithfully recaptured when the picture was uh, published again. Um, here's another example. Um, this is a, a microscope made of brass. So let's look at the, the front end of that microscope under today's microscope. And there is the picture. It's a letter B. There is the picture, rather crudely broken up by the 1973 halftone. And here is the same part, under a more finely screened halftone, for the new book. And you can see it's not a B that they've got here, but a halftone screened version of that image. And you see that little one there appears here too. It, it, if that had been remade, then the chances that those two would be conjoined are infinitesimally small. And so I realised that here was I, arch scourge of the plagiarist, having a picture provided for a new book, illicitly stolen from an old book by the same author. And indeed, I was plagiarising myself. Now, that is plagiarism, because the, the taking the image from the earlier book without proper authority is theft. And I'm happy to say that when the book was launched, uh, there was a clutch of the senior executives of the British Library Publishing Division sitting in, in, the, sitting in the front row of the large lecture theatre in the Natural History Museum when I came to talk about the book. And I concluded my talk by drawing everybody's attention to this interesting fact. I've never seen publishers look more squirmingly embarrassed in all of my life. But it does make you realise that the notion that there is a level of integrity in the highest echelons of publishing, I'm afraid isn't true. That explains why it is that publishers are fat, uh, uh, rubicund, healthy, and, and, and gleaming and glistening, whereas authors are grey, slight, slender, malnourished, and wheezing individuals by comparison. <laughs> publishing is where the money comes in, and they publish largely by ripping off their authors. And as you can see, even the most reputable of companies will shamelessly plagiarise um, from a book, knowing that they shouldn't, if it's to their advantage so to do. So yes, students are plagiarising all the time from the internet, 
And the fact that students can now get through, I mean, the, the, the impulse in every university is to give everybody a degree. That's how you, you, you keep up there in those grades. You'll do everything you possibly can to get people through. <coughs> Scholars will occasionally publish entire articles, hardly rewritten, knowing that the chances that the new article will ever be put in juxtaposition with the old are quite small. With the internet's help, of course, the chances are, are much higher than they were. Television. Almost all the documentaries that you see on TV began as a book, a scholarly paper, a magazine article, or a newspaper report. Very few of them ever originate anything. And you can, if luck is really against you, even unwittingly end up by plagiarising yourself. Now, the words of that esteemed mathematics scholar Tom Lehrer rarely seemed more I apposite. Never the I first meet the great Lobachevsky. In one word, he told me the secret of success. Plagiarize. Plagiarize. Let no one else's work evade your eyes. Remember why the good Lord made your eyes, so don't shade your eyes, but plagiarize, plagiarize, plagiarize. I do remember the last bit. Just be sure always to call it research. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Brian. You've kind of agreed that you will take questions. Yes, yes, any questions or points, I'd be very happy to. Please ask away. This is not on plagiarism, but did I correctly hear you say that there were no depictions, no portraits of Robert Hooke? Is that correct? Yes, it you is the case. contemporary portraits. Uh, there may be imagined ones. There's one purporting to be book hanging in the hall of Barnard's Inn in a high home. Yes, uh, there is. Um, uh, uh, there was a book recently published on book in which somebody put together, it was a, a, a student's book, a, a, a young reader's book, in which somebody had painstakingly created a bust out of clay and photographed it. And I sometimes use that to illustrate uh, Robert Hooke, uh, because uh, it does look like he was. Lisa Jardine, uh, my very esteemed and much appreciated friend, recently published a book on Robert Hooke, which went around the world with a portrait uh, of very slightly... Um, uh, very slightly identified portrait of Robert Hooke on the cover. <clears throat> the book hadn't been out for more than a week before some Dutch academic said, no, no, it's a botanist from, from Utrecht or something of the sort, a well-known portrait, though not well enough known. And of course the book, meanwhile, had had its jackets printed and gone in tens of thousands all around the world with this non-existent picture of Hooke. And indeed, it looks hookish in a kind of a way, but I think that whoever saw it and realised that it wasn't immediately annotated was too keen to say this must have been Robert Hooke. Um, there are mentions in Hooke's writings of him having sat for an artist. So there is a suggestion that he was portrayed during his life. But he was a great, um, initially, colleague and later sworn enemy of Isaac Newton. And it is believed that Newton had any image or relic of Hooke destroyed so that Newton could have himself promoted at the expense of Hooke. Uh, I mean, we now almost worship Newton as we worship Darwin. Both, in my view, are, are grossly uh, misplaced. I mean, uh, uh, Darwin clearly believed in Lamarckian evolution in much of his writings, and indeed uh, Newton believed in angels, fairies, and the transmutation of the elements and all sorts of other weird things. So, I mean, I would like us to see the value of these people's scholarly work put into some context, but glorifying them seems to me a terrible mistake. And Newton set out to destroy Hooke's reputation and to boost his own. Well, he didn't succeed in destroying Hooke's reputation, but his mastery of spin has indeed created Newton himself, a role which he partly deserves, but not as much as he gets. What is the relationship between copyright and plagiarism? That's an extremely good point. Uh, one of my friends years ago uh, had published a very long paper and it was entitled, um, Can Common Cosmetics Cause Cancer? Wonderful assonance, a great alliterative title. And it was about four and a half thousand words long. Uh, she and I, the author and I, were students together, knew her very well. 
And she rang me one day and she said, I'm going to join you as an author. I'm doing a chapter for a book. And I said, oh, marvellous. You must tell me when it comes out. Well, she never did. And one day I happened to be up there to give a lecture. The door opened and in came one of her colleagues with the book and said, Di, I brought your book back. Hello, Brian, how are you? So we shook hands. And he said, have you seen Diana's chapter? And I said, no, I've heard about it, though. And she was trying to get the book from me, saying, no, 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 it's, it's not important at all. And there was the chapter. The title was now something like um, LD50 and Oncogene Correlations with Tetragenic Effects of uh, Possible Carcinogenic <laughs> Compositions of Compounds Commonly Used to Adorn the Human Face, or something of the sort, very academic <laughs> translation. Copyright in titles. You could write a book called The Day of the Jackal, or the Holy Bible, if you wish. There is no copyright in titles. You must not pass off a work as being that of another author. Passing off is a criminal offence. But there is no copyright in titles. I said the copyright is in the exact form of words that lie within the body of the text. That is to say, and therefore you have infringed the copyright of this journal. And she said, oh my God, what will they do? And I said to her, unkindly though, truthfully, I said, nothing will happen. And she said, why? I said, because nobody will ever read them. And indeed, <laughs> that proved to be the case. You don't read papers, you cite papers. When people put together their bibliographical references, they copy a list of references from a previous publication, add the four or five they happen in a desultory fashion to have accidentally encountered, and there's their new bibliography. So every time anybody publishes on any subject, the list of references gets disproportionately larger and larger. Indeed, there is one case, and this is a diversion for which I apologise. Uh, Clifford Dobell is the man who wrote the biography of Leibniz, the great microscope pioneer. And Dobell once published um, an obituary of Dr. O. Uplavici. Because O. Uplavici was a widely cited author in the 1920s. But O. Uplavici is the check for on or concerning dysentery. <laughs> and it was the title of a paper. But in fact, it was misplaced by somebody as Uplavici, O, as though it was the author of the paper. <laughs> and some writers, according to Dobell, acknowledged the help of Dr. O. Uplavici, <laughs> and one person even wrote to thank him for lengthy discussions on the subject. <laughs> so here was a non-existent paper that survived for decades, and rather than Dobell in a pernickety and snippish way, uh, pouring cold water on it, he simply published an obituary to Dr. O. Uplavici <laughs> and told the life story of this miscitation as though it was a life story of a man. It was beautifully, wittily, cleverly done. So this, in a way, is an important distinction. Plagiarism is the theft of intellectual property. Copyright is the theft of, a, of an exact image or the theft of exact words. And indeed, if Diana had kept the same title, but she had paraphrased all of the paper, publishing all the same material, but with the grammar and syntax being somewhat differently expressed, and with occasional substituted adjectives, then she, then she would not have infringed the journal's original copyright. And indeed, if somebody else had done it, they wouldn't have infringed her copyright either. They would have infringed her intellectual property. So it's plagiarism. But if the words are different, they haven't infringed her copyright. Are we done, John? I think we are. Well, thank you very thank much. You all very much. No, thank you.